Uh, the first step of, of, these, of these surveys is habitat assessment. And so I'll show you kind of what we do there. And that's, it's basically computer based. Uh, you guys might recognize this area a little bit. There's, there's us, I think. I pulled this up on Google Earth. So the trees aren't as populated right here. But uh, basically, so what we do is look for forest habitat and what we think is habitat that's going to be suitable for, for bats to be uh, forming their maternity colonies. So if I'm looking on the computer and I'm trying to determine if uh, bats are here, let's say that this isn't all trees here that don't have leaves right now. I'm looking at this right here, and I'm looking at this corridor right here. And that's where I'm going to try and do my surveys and try to you know, say that there might be bats here. We don't know, but that's, that's a stronger possibility than, say, up by these houses or something, or, or out in agricultural fields, because it's just so open that you can't say that bats are going to be there. And so after that, we move on to the acoustic surveys. Here, I'll go back to this so you guys can see the kind of order of operations. And that's what this guy is right here. This is uh, what we call an anabat unit. We set these guys up out in the field, and we leave them there for two days. We leave them up there for two days, and it's a, it's a passive uh, detector. And it just sits out there, and it will record bat calls for, it, it's uh, got an automated system that uh, begins recording 30 minutes before sunset, and then it goes off 30 minutes after sunrise. Um, and between that time, it records any bat that flies by. Um, it doesn't tell us how many bats there are, and it doesn't tell us the overall abundance of them, because uh, a single species could sit there, and it could f swarm the whole night right around here, and we could get thousands of calls from it, but it's the same bat. But what it can tell us is what species are in the area. Um, and so with that, over here, I was showing you the uh, that right there, that's what we do to visualize uh, bat calls. This is a, a series of clicks by a bat. Uh, let, me, let me pull this out real quick, show you what the unit actually looks like. Sorry, jumping around. It's this guy right here. Basically, it's a very sensitive uh, recorder. This is a microphone, and this is all the equipment that we have different settings to, to sensitivity to record and we try to filter out bug noises and insects and other other noises that come up during the night and try to just focus in on what the bats are um, and so I mean something simple as doing that you can't hear that but it's very loud and so a bat just clicking around like let me turn it up just a little bit more so you can really hear it that's what a bat will sound like. If, you're, if you have one of these on you when you're out, outside, pardon me? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so that's all you'll hear, though. I mean, oh, it went off. Batteries must be dying. That's what, that's what a bat will sound like, exactly. And then you'll just, and then it'll go through, and then. And so it'll get faster and slower depending on if it's if it's in that feeding buzz, if it's found a if found an insect or or not. But so we can't. It's not like uh, bird calls where we can tell the species just by the sound of it. All of them sound the same to our to our ears. So that's what we use this program. It's called uh, Analook, um, developed in tandem with Anabats, and we use it to visualize it. And basically, we use this different uh, levels of kilohertz to determine what species it is. And if it's a, a higher frequency up here, like this one is, it's going to most likely be one of those myotis bats, like northern long-eared bat, or little brown, or, or tricolored. If it's more down here, it's going to be one of those big browns or hoary bat. And the lower it gets, the closer it gets to us being able to hear it. Those super high frequencies, uh, unless you have a, a, you know, five hours, at minimum five hours. And so we sit out there for five or six hours. And we have a little camp set away from, from the nets where we have kind of our measuring tools and other stuff like that that we use to weigh them and measure their forearm and uh, tell their sex, what you know, male or female, or, or their reproductive condition. Uh, with females, we can tell if they're pregnant, if they're lactating, or, or done with that for the season. Um, but we check these every 10 minutes, and basically we just walk up to it. We've got our headlamps on, and we just kind of peruse the net and see if we've got anything in it. And if we do, you know, most of these aren't this tall. We've got a pulley system, and we just ratchet them down, walk up to it, and then we sit there and meticulously take out a bat. Um, so if we do catch bats, 
we come back, we come back to our little camp there, and and uh, uh oh. <laughs> oh, here I can help you. Yeah, was it back here? Or was it right here? Oh, it was right there. Yep. There we go. Take this opportunity to take a drink. And so, yeah, after we after we catch it back, we bring it back to our little camp where we've got little camping chairs and table, and we work it up a little bit. So this is an example of a big brown bat just getting a, a forearm measurement. And forearm measurement is one of the characteristics we use to d uh, tell different species. And, uh, you know, big browns will be anywhere from 40 to 50 millimeters on their right forearm. And then northern long-eared bats will be, you know, around the 37 mark. So right away when we do that, we usually go right to the forearm measurement because that's a characteristic we can use to like right away, especially for new people that are being trained on how to ID bats. It's like, what's the forearm measurement? And then that can break apart, you know, a lot of bats that it's not. So if you've got a 37 forearm, it's obviously not a big brown or, or a red or something like that. Uh, like I said, we take, we take the weight of them. We take, uh, we look at, you know, their sex, their age. Like I said before, with the light shining through the hand and, um, yeah, if it's one of the target species, the next step is we attach radio transmitters to them. And that's what that looks like. Scott, right there, if you could just hold that up, that's the size of a transmitter that we put on their backs. And you can pass that around, just make sure I get that back. That's about $200 right there, so. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. I've got my antenna over there, so. Um, but so yeah, we, we do that, and then the next day, uh, we go out and we track them and basically we've got this little antenna here and a little little receiver. I didn't bring that in, but basically we, we walk around the woods and, you know, we start where we caught it and then we listen and we're listening for a oh, boop, boop, boop. And then uh, the louder it gets, the closer you are to it. It's not, it doesn't change the, the frequency of it. It doesn't change the, the speed of the beeps. It's what you're looking for is it to get louder. So if I'm, you know, tracking that transmitter, it's all of a sudden getting louder and louder. And then I can locate the tree based on that. And that's what we're looking for when we do this is trying to find uh, the roost tree. And we circle up the tree and then we, we can tell exactly what tree it's in. And then we come back at night and do an uh, emergence count and try to count how many bats are flying out there. So, you had a question? How many transmitters have I put around the Aiken area? Uh, about nine, nine to ten. So, we have been catching long eared bats. Um, and then, yeah, we'll go out and track them. And depending on where they are, if we have access to the site, uh, we do, we can either find the roost or we just do triangulation to give our best. Um, excuse me, best guess of where they are. So we'll, we'll drive along the public roads and then we, we listen here. And so basically, yeah, let me go back to this map because this will be a good opportunity to show you that. I'll get right to that after this, after I answer this question. One more. There it is. All right, so let's say we caught a bat here at, at the conservation center. I'm going to go around before, I'll, I'll go right to where we caught it. And if I don't hear anything, then I'm going to start expanding my search area. And let's say that this blue, uh, you know, fake project area is roads here. And basically, I didn't hear it at all when I was over by the, the red dot over there. But now I'm driving along this road and I hear a signal over here. What I do is I'll, I'll get out of my truck and then I'll take a bearing of where the signal is the strongest. And let's say it's going right like that. Now, I can't tell distance at all from that. I just got a straight line and a bearing this way. So what I do is I mark a coordinates, uh, take, a, take a waypoint there, and then take a bearing. And then let's, I'll continue driving. And then, oh, all of a sudden, I've got this, another strong point right here. So I'm going to get out, take a bearing, and lo and behold, it's right here. And so now I'm starting to get a, a biangulation. Now I'm going to go all the way up here. And let's say I get it right here. This is a perfect world right here where I got a nice triangulation. But now my bearing is right there. So now I've got one, two, three, and it's about right there. And so we can go in with that and say, you know, with pretty good accuracy, it's, it's within, these, within these trees right here that there's a roost there. Um, yes, ma'am. Those, those are uh, the transmitters are about 
two miles max, and that's on like perfect, you know, if you've got a flat habitat and then all of a sudden you're at a rise and you can listen down, it's about a mile. So they're not very strong. Uh, they last about a week. So what we're trying to do, and I'll explain how, to, how we attach them. Let me go back to that picture. Um, you see, oh, one more. You see how small, how small they are when you guys are holding them. We're trying to get them smaller and smaller as the years go by because um, we don't want to impede their flight at all. This is, like I said, their livelihood. They're trying to catch uh, insects. They're trying to forage, and they're trying to fly and raise young. So we don't want to impede that at all or have them die because this is too bulky and it weighs them down too much. So getting it smaller is great, but it also has its drawbacks. The battery life goes down a lot. We can, these transmitters basically last a week. So we can get a week worth of data, and they only can go out about a, about a mile. Sorry, I didn't repeat any of that question. She asked how far we could sense it. And then this guy asked how, um, how we attach them. So basically what we do after we've determined it's a species that we are wanting to put a transmitter on, uh, right here, we go in between their shoulder blades, and we separate the fur, and we'll cut, cut a little bit away and so that we have skin on skin. And then we take uh, surgical glue, and we put a little bit on the transmitter and a little bit on the bat. And then, yeah, we just glue it up and then wrap the fur back around it. And it, you know, hopefully on, on a good transmitter, it, it doesn't even look like they have anything there except for the wire hanging off the back. And so it's, uh, it stays on, too, for, it can stay on a little longer than the week that the, uh, that the transmitter's uh, working, but using the surgical glue uh, with the sweats and oils and then them rubbing in, going into their uh, roost and stuff, it eventually falls off, and then that's, that's the end of it. We can't track it anymore. It's just uh, garbage out there, so. Okay. So the whole goal of that is to find this roost tree, like I was saying. Here is a, an example of a roost tree. It looks like just any other tree that, yeah, this could be a tree that I just took a picture of, and you guys wouldn't be the wiser, but it is actually a, a roost tree where bats that were found flying are uh, roosting up in there. And so if like a northern long-eared bat, they're just looking for any crack or crevice or really any open space in the tree, that leaves a whole lot of potential habitat out in the forest for, for these bats. Like I said, for Indiana bats, it's a little, it's a little easier to find because you'll be walking through a forest and you see a snag that's got open canopy because they're looking for that uh, solar exposure, then they can, then it's a little easier to track because you're like, oh, it's gotta be this tree, and then you start there. Yes, sir? Okay, so, you know, you've seen bat houses. Mm -hmm. How are bat houses effective in uh, housing bats? They can be very good. Uh, they're, they're actually very suitable habitat and very good for them, but the, the problem that people a lot of times run into is, I just put up a bat house, I don't have any bats in my bat house. It can take a couple of years for bats to realize that this is a better habitat for them. They've, they've been going to these roost trees for sometimes decades, like, my, like the example of my professor. If they've got a good roost that they know is good and it serves their purpose, they don't really have any reason to leave, um, just because there's a, a nicer, newer, man-made house you know, down the road from them. But if they give it time, eventually, you know, one bat will go there, then two, and then, then it's, you got a lot of bats in there, and then it can help with the bug control around your yard. But yeah, it can, it, they, they do work well. It just can take time to, to have them. Okay, so follow up question. Mm -hmm. Has there been any work done on doing that? Yeah, actually, I, I did, a, um, my professor, when I was working in uh, Illinois, southern Illinois, he put some up years ago out in the, in the middle of the woods. And we came back uh, while I was doing my surveys and just to see how they were doing. And we set up one of those uh, harp traps and kind of just shook them, and they all fell out. Um, but there was hundreds, hundreds, and thousands of bats in there. So they work very well, and they, they they can decide to go there, but like I said, it took it took a few years for them to decide that that was better because they have so, especially this was down in Shawnee National Forest, there's a lot, a lot of good habitat down there, and so it takes some convincing to go to say this habitat's, or this uh, roost is gonna be better than, than not. Yes, sir?
Right, right, yeah. So is there any preference to where they have their day roots? And yes, there is. So, so what they're looking for, and this is, this is a good example here, you can see the bats just kind of under, for, or under some bark here. That's a wildly good example. You barely ever see them when you're tracking them. But um, what they're looking for is um, they basically go into a, a mini hibernation during the day in the summer. It's called daily torpor. And what happens is why they form these maternity colonies, like I said, they're trying to conserve all their energy so that they don't waste it on staying warm to raising their young. And the way that they do this is they cluster together in those groups of 30 to 60, and they do it in, in areas in, in the woods where it's very warm and humid, like you said. And so they will go to riparian areas where it's a little more humid. And basically, they shut off um, their metabolism and their their energy control or their heat control and basically let the ambient temperature dictate what their body temperature is. So they shut off and then they, they shut off that and focus all their energy on raising their young or, or making milk and then the ambient temperature there. So they are looking for more hot and humid places. And Indiana bats are, are a good example. They use, uh, like I said, they use those open kind of snags where there's some uh, open areas in the canopy. And why they do that is because they're just sitting under the bark like that and then for six hours of the day there's just the sun blasting right on the right on the bark and so that's not much of a of a barrier but it's enough to really just create a little hot box and they sit in there and get roasted and that's they're perfectly fine with that because then they don't have to worry about raising their body temperature at all they're letting the the ambient temperature decide um, decide their temperature um, interestingly enough that's what I did my master's on and uh, I had temperature sensitive radio transmitters uh, very similar to this one, but it could d uh, determine the body temperature of the bat just because of their skin temperature that it was next to. And uh, when I graphed it out in the fall, that's exactly what I saw. I'd see a really high peak activity, you know, in the hundreds of degrees, and then right at, right at sunrise, they would just drop. It would just drop right to ambient temperature, and then it would slowly climb up. And I had uh, also uh, little microclimate detectors that would uh, detect the temperature of the of the roost and so I would I was able to tell the roost temperature and it was exactly the same as as the bat so they basically and then after a certain point right at the hottest point when they uh, around sunset they would be kind of spike activity and it would stay at that temperature and then they would fly off and you'd lose the bat so I had many days of just high temperature down gradual rise high temperature and then they're gone and then repeat so that's why, that's why, so they will look for, for uh, higher temperatures and, and they have very specific microclimate requirements and there is, and it changes day to day. Like if it's rainy and they didn't really eat that much, they might, they might switch roosts and um, go to somewhere where it's warmer where they can just, you know, focus in and not, not have to burn any energy at all. But they really are dictated by, by the weather. They're not going to go flying in high winds because it's it's just a little bit of skin and there's such light bats that they'll get tossed around in the wind so and the bugs aren't out there as, as well they can't uh, uh, forage as well and same with rain or or heavy storms they're not going to go out there a lot like us if, if it's raining ah, I think I'm going to just stay in tonight and they do that and then I get to do that too <laughs> so that's the ultimate goal is finding the roost trees and uh, kind of going from there um, and then do an emergence count, and then we basically we just sit right underneath the right underneath the trees, and you know with those you can you can get pretty accurate onto where where you think the roost is, and if, obviously with a lot more experience you can say I know that they're they're roosting right there, and they're going to come out of this this cavity right here, and a lot of times that you're absolutely right, and then you just sit there and you count. They're they're pretty they're pretty uh, cooperative. They come out single file usually if because it's it's not just an opening where they just pour out and it's ah oh, bats you know it's uh, they come out, you know, uh, usually out of a one opening, and it's one flutter away, a couple of seconds, one. And, it, you know, during activity, it'll be one, two, three, four, five, you know, like that. But, um, yeah. And uh, a cool story, I was down in uh, central Arizona, and I was doing a bat survey down there, and we were mist netting and stuff. And I was driving around, and I saw this was a huge, huge wind farm down there, and so we had access to the whole whole plot of land. It was just kind of open sagebrush desert and uh, uh, pinion juniper. And I found this abandoned house. And I was just, you know, we had some time to kill. And I was like, oh, man, you know, abandoned houses are great for, for bats. And I wonder if there's any in there. And I walked in there, and I could tell right away that there was a lot of bats. And up in the attic, I saw thousands of bats just flying around and, and everything. And I got on the horn and ordered up some uh, uh, 
goggles for, for my crews and uh, we sat out there that night, you know, all, all spread around that house and we you know, watched it and there was, I think, 1,500 bats that came out of there. And I mean, it's, that's, that's obviously a really hard thing to count. That's a rough estimate. You're sitting there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and uh, we had little counters and stuff. But, um, you know, them, they even used the front door. You know, they had broken windows and a back door, but they were very polite and they used, they mostly used the front door. So that was uh, very cooperative bats.